you all for coming out. I know it's a little early for some of you, um, but I think that Sean and Hannah are worth, and Hannah Buck are married. Uh, Sean is a graduate of the SVAT program and of FIA cohort nine, number nine, uh, and Hannah is a graduate of SCAT, where they are from, and all of the jazz of how they got there. So let's give a round of applause for Sean. <laughs> Um, so our talk today, everybody, is going to be um, stuff you'll wish you knew. It's sort of stuff that we wish that we knew coming out of uh, our colleges and getting out into the industry and being like, oh, that would have been cool to know beforehand. And what it's like to work in outsourcing as well. So today's lesson is brought to you by Sean Buck, this guy. And uh, myself, Hannah Wood Buck, kind of. My name's not been changed yet. Um, basically. We both work, both work at this company called Mindwalk Studios. Um, this is who's Mindwalk and why, do you, why should you care? Basically, Mindwalk Studios, shortly, is a studio for video games. Um, that means that basically whenever we have clients such as Naughty Dog or Microsoft Studios or EA or whoever, they've got a game that they're working on and they're like, well, crap, we've got all this art that we have to do and we let's send it to Mindwalk, they can get it done for us. That's essentially, in a nutshell, what Mindwalk does. These are some of the games that we've worked on more recently. Um, things like you'll see up there, Uncharted 4, we're actively working on right now. Dead Space 3 is one of our more famous for different need for speed that never actually was. Um, and the DLC for The Last of Us, Left Behind. Um, so you see we've done a lot, a lot of AAA stuff. We've done a lot of mobile games that, that Mindwalk does for other companies. So the first thing, um, I'm going to go over a little bit about production and things that this is predominantly focused on production is relevant to, in general, in the industry work. So as a producer, one of the biggest things, you'll see my subtitle, Keeping the Hobbits from Isengard in the damn first place. Basically, if your hobbits are your team and Isengard is trouble, it's really awesome if you can rescue the hobbits from Isengard when they get there, but it's really way more important that you can keep them out of trouble in the first place. And that's the summary of what production is as you go in. So um, the first most important thing, it matters if you talk good, basically. You are the voice of your team, especially in outsourcing. Um, my biggest job is to be the liaison between my artists or my animators and the clients that I'm talking to. They rarely actually talk to each other. Like the client and the artist don't often talk. Um, We've got a language barrier yes. a little bit. A little bit. If they're all Chinese and our clients are all Western, then they literally can't communicate. So that's what I'm there to do. So that said, I am their voice. And as a producer, when you're talking, not just, again, not just in outsourcing, but anywhere, do you want your team to sound like they're professional? Do you want them to sound like they're organized, like you know what you're talking about, like they know what they're doing? Or are you going to be overly casual? Are you going to be unprofessional? Are you going to be rude? Are you going to be disorganized? It's really, really important not just for your own professional you know, goals, but also for your teams and how they're perceived in terms of other things. That said, it also matters if you write good. Okay? Just because you're a good speaker does not make you a good writer. There are way too many people who write the way that, even if you're a good speaker, that does not make you, like I said, a good writer. Um, especially when doing emails, when doing Skype, when doing any of these things, it's really important that you think about what you're saying when you write it. Don't just say it and then hit the send button. You should write it, read it, edit it, read it again, and then send it. Um, it sounds like it takes way more time than you want to spend on it, but I promise, I promise it in the, in the, end, in the end, it will be worth it to you. So we're going to play a little game with words. Can anybody tell me, use that top it's in a sentence? Somebody. I will like call you out. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's color is black-brown. Its color is black-brown. <laughs> Good. Its chest is hairy. Exactly. So that top its is possessive. Don't ever, ever, ever mess it up. Second one. That means that that is it is. So it is dangerous to go alone. Always remember that. If you mess that up, you would be surprised at how many clients would look at that and be like, well, you obviously can't speak English. They get really like snippy real fast. Cool. Another one. Who can tell me how to use the top word in a sentence? Yes, sir. That's your, uh, 
Your mother was a hamster. Exactly. That's what it is. That means the next one is you are. You are not prepared. Right? One last one. Who can use the top one? <laughs> they are taking the hobbits to Isengard. Exactly. What about the second one? <laughs> Their father smelt of elderberries. Exactly. Which means the last one. There is where I buy my grapes. I didn't have a clever one for the last one. I'm sorry. Anyway. So, yeah, it's good. It sounds like, for the most part, you guys got that. So when you're writing, make sure that you use them properly. It is actually not OK even when you're talking in Skype. That's one thing that I think people get confused a lot. I have a lot of my clients, like guys from Naughty Dog and guys from ArenaNet and whoever, just on my Skype because it's the easiest way to talk to them. And it's really easy to sort of slip into a casual speak when you're on Skype and just chatting with them. But it is still, like, you're still professional. You're still their employee, essentially. Um, and so it's important that you are speaking to them in a professional manner, even on Skype, even through email. And if you're like voice chatting or whatever, then you need to be speaking properly. Well, and these are still official conversations, yep. um, especially with you know, Skype and everything. You, you keep that history for forever when you talk with a client because that is, that is a official communicate between you and someone else at a company, yep. right? And so information was passed along there and you get you know, six months down the road, something goes horribly wrong, and you're trying to figure out what it was, and suddenly you're involving the next three people ahead of you, you know, the producer, the produ producer's boss, the executive producer, and the executive producer's boss, trying to figure out why we just, why some big catastrophe just happened, and well, now you've got to go quote this big section of Skype conversation you had you probably want to look professional when you're handing that to guys who make, you know, $300,000 a year, right? <laughs> Just um, a thought. <laughs> yeah. So it, when you're talking like that, it really is important, and it's going to save your butt to just, yeah. you know, talk for, you know, write professionally and make sure you're spelling everything correctly. I mean, it's worth it even to just, you type a message, and you're like, oh, that grammar is, like, weird. Edit it and change it. Yep. It doesn't really matter. They're not going to be like, why'd you edit your message or something? Like, just go edit it. Yep. Make it look nice. You can do that. So make sure you do. Next, honesty and diplomacy. How to win friends and cover your ass. This is kind of what Sean was just talking about. Um, that's what it is. Um, it's all about how transparent you can be with your client. Again, this is mostly in terms of outsourcing, but it's also very true of full game studios. For example, um, we had one project that we're working on that I can't tell you what it is, so just know that it's really cool. Um, and it was like five artists all new, and he was really slow. So we were like, well, we're supposed to be getting all of these, each of these things done in 15 man days, but it was taking him more like 20 or, or 25 to get this done. And especially in China, because everything is all about saving face and having the right front and whatever, um, it would be really easy for us to sort of try to hide that in the numbers and be like, oh, no, well, all of our artists are working the way that they're supposed to, and it's okay, like, uh, we're getting it done on time, and, you know, whatever. Especially because the client was very, very adamant about this needs to be done in 15 days because we don't have the budget for it to take any longer, right? So instead, what we did is we were like, hey, clients, just so you know, we have this one artist who's working a little bit slowly. What we're doing to fix that is we're working, him with, we're working on training with him. He's working a little bit of overtime. And if the worst case scenario, if in a couple weeks he's not getting any faster, we will trade him out for a different artist. And just because we were like very honest and upfront with him about it, they now trust us with so much more. Um, there was actually another thing that happened that was a, a similar case where we had an artist suddenly leave the company. Um, they, they had problems back home and they just had to leave really suddenly. And we were like, hey client, this artist left really fast. And they were like, oh, it's cool, man. I, we know you got it covered. You know, Literally, those were the words out of their mouth. It's cool, man. We know you got it covered. Speaking of being professional, right? Um, so, so just that very first instance of us being really honest saved us in the end when we had this big problem happen. Another instance is with invoices. I realized at one of our really big clients, Naughty Dog, um, that I overcharged them for something the previous month. And I was like, oh my god, freaking out about it. And I just talked to the client. I was like, hey, I just realized that I overcharged you by this much money on, on the previous invoice. So what I'm going to do is this month, I'm going to total everything up, and I'll just subtract that amount. And they were like, oh, you do that? And we were like, well, yeah, of course. Like We overcharged you. And they actually told us that they had some other companies, some other outsourcers, who 
actually did make mistakes like that and just never said anything about it. Never told the client, just sort of let it slide under the rug. And guess what? Naughty Dog doesn't work with them anymore. That's that. You know, they just, that, whoever that person was that prepared that invoice and didn't make an alert lost their company, Naughty Dog, as a client. I mean, they're, they're a huge contract yep. right now. Um, I mean, you guys know the games they're making. I mean, you guys have seen stuff for Uncharted 4 coming out, right? Um, they're making huge games, and so they need a lot of support. I think our team is at... Our team is 32. 30, 32 right now, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I mean, that's, that's a bigger huge than some studios have, period, yep. for, for an art team, right? And we're one of five outsourced their work. Outsourcers they're working with, I think. So, whatever company just lost that entire mm -hmm. right. Um, so it's just little things like that can make yeah. huge differences. So in the end, basically, the moral of the story, these stories, is that it is better to just be upfront and honest about it. It gets really easy at the very beginning to be like, oh my god, I've messed up this thing. But I promise, it's better just to say, hey, I've messed this up. Here's how I'm going to fix it. Next thing, phrasing. Words are weapons, use them with care. This is true not only on when you're talking to clients or talking to um, employers, but when you're talking to your team, okay? Like, as a producer, one of your biggest jobs, aside from liaisoning and, and being the voice of your team and all this stuff that I've talked to before, is keeping your artists and your animators or whoever happy. Um, and if it's like not just art outsourcing, it's your designers and your programmers as well. Um, you don't wanna just, you're not there to make their lives miserable, you're there to help them do what they do. So in this said um, one team who had this team of artists who was, to be blunt, awful. They were terrible, terrible artists. Um, and they were all really slow, they were really new, and they were ready to go um, to work on this project. It was, a, it was a mobile game, like a sports mobile game. And in the, basically what started happening is that quality check the assets that were getting sent to the clients. And the clients eventually actually got these assets and they were like, guys, these are awful what are you doing? And we were like, oh my god. Like, so this was a big issue that we had to go in and we had to resolve. And so um, what we ended up doing, we, the, the producers on this team, ended up saying, well, we've got another guy who's really good at QC. We'll send him in to go help the team lead um, QC the work. But for this team lead who's already losing his mind trying to like, get this team and everything to work together, we didn't want it to look like, hey, you messed up. So now we're going to send in this guy to do it for you and to watch you. Because that's awful. That's terrible for morale. And uh, you know, it is technically his fault that those assets all went out um, before being looked at properly. But you know, we don't, we don't want to just rag on the guy. So instead, what we said was, hey, we see that you have your hand on. So we're going to give you this guy, Josh, who's going to help you out with the QC thing. He is here at your disposal. Use him when you need to. And Josh is going to make sure that he looks at everything that goes out. Doesn't that sound better than you suck and we're giving somebody else to do it for you, right? So. Um, but the important thing there is the guy had help. We resolved the issue. Both people were happy, both the guy that we brought in and, and the team lead. But the team lead also was still aware that this was an issue. Oh, it's OK, baby. We're going to give you somebody. More geared towards like producers and stuff. But uh, artists in the room, um, you know, you kind of are all at different stages of you haven't started Capstone yet, you're starting it, I'm not sure where you guys are yet. Um, but you're gonna have, you know, some of you are gonna be leads, um, and uh, that, that responsibility for that kind of thing isn't just on your production uh, side of, of the team. Um, art leads, you have to do that too. Uh, a little empathy goes a really long way. Uh, if someone's having trouble with something, you know, fight, they're, they're having a little trouble with something. You don't just go take that away and be like, "Hey, deal with that. I'm gonna do something." Um, you, you know, you try and be a little more diplomatic about it, help them learn, help them train up, you know, um, things like that uh, across spectrum on just how you deal with other people that you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Say what, especially working in outsourcing, you will get clients that are obnoxious. Uh, that's true of any, any retail industry, right? I don't know how many people in here have worked retail before, or food service, or anything like that, right? So you know, you know, right? You're standing up there at the register, or so when you get that, for example, 
And we were working on it, working on it, working on it. They sent it to us. They were like, hey, we need you to make this thing. And we were like, OK, we'll make it. And then um, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I got a call from my boss saying, hey, whatever happened to that one asset for that one client? Because apparently they needed it yesterday. It would have been cool if they told me that as the producer, you know, that they needed it yesterday. So what ended up happening is that I had to go back into the office at 3 o'clock in the morning. The office manager had to go back into the office at 3 o'clock in the morning. The team lead, the artist, and the environment team lead all had to go to the office at 3 o'clock in the morning to finish this thing for the client that they needed yesterday. But again, they never told me that. And then when I was in the office and the artist was trying to finish up the thing really quick so they could get it into the review that the client was having, they were on, to, on Skype and going like, why didn't you get this thing in? I told you that you know, it was supposed to be due this day and whatever. And I said, no, sir. You told me it was due on the 15th. Today is the 13th. This is where it's quoted, quoting uh, Skype chats. Yes, this is, this is Skype chats. Mm -hmm. you, you said the 15th. This is the 13th. And he was like, oh, well, it is technically only due on the 15th, but our art director is leaving tomorrow, so we actually needed it today. And I was like, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and what did you just tell me? Like, what did you just, do you see the words that just came out of your mouth, right? But instead, I took a deep breath, and I said, oh, I see how that would be a problem. In the future, could you please let us know ahead of time when that happens? Because I don't want to have to pull my artists out of bed really late like this. I'm afraid that the asset won't be as good quality as we had originally intended it because we're trying to get it to you so much earlier, right? And the guy was just like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. What ended up happening is we got the asset in, it looked kind of crappy, and then after the review, they sent it back and we fixed it, and now it's all fine. But again, 3 o'clock in the morning, I did not have anything nice to say to this guy on Skype. But you really, really have to pay attention to what your mood is and make sure that the words that you were saying are nothing but diplomatic, even when it's entirely <coughs> the client's fault. OK, red and white flags. This is another huge, huge thing about being a producer. Um, red flags, obviously, is this is an issue that I foresee coming. White flags is I surrender, I'm sorry, right? Um, I know that probably in all of your production classes, any producers, they talk about red flags a lot. Um, things like, you know, again, keeping the hobbits, the hobbits from Isengard in the damn first place. Um, this will be things like they've sent us a brief for something, and all the references that they sent us are really small, really blurry, or look nothing at all like each other. And so as a producer, I'm, I'm not an artist at all, right? So I don't necessarily know what references the artist need. But even I can look at that and be like, that's confusing as a brief. Let me go ahead, before I send this to the artist even at all, I'm going to talk to the client and say, hey, we're not really sure what it is that you're looking for here. Can you send us more references? Or alternatively, I'll say, hey, artist, I'm not sure what's going on in this brief. Could you find a couple more references that you think that they're asking for? And we'll send it to the client and make sure before we start work on it, right? Example of a red flag that you want to catch beforehand. There have been some times when we didn't do that, because either I didn't see the brief, or the person who was translating the brief was a new translator and didn't quite get it right, or any number of things can go wrong and inevitably will go wrong. And so what happened is we got this brief that was really confusing, and we made it wrong and sent it back to the client. And the client was like, what is wrong with you? That's not what we asked for at all. And we were like, uh, didn't really you didn't really ask for anything. We don't know what you're saying. Um, but there comes a point at which it is not worth your time to argue with the client anymore. In which case, you just say, you're right. We did it wrong. We'll fix it. We expect it will take us another OK. And they say, yes, just make sure you do this this time. And you say, thank you. And then that's when you slide in the little thing that says, in the future, it would be great if you could give us that information when you send us the brief. And that's a perfectly diplomatic way of saying that. But at the same time, you're not saying, we messed it up because you were wrong. We just said, you're right. We did it wrong. I'm sorry. We'll fix it. And another thing, this is kind of all project dependent too. Like, yes. what what is a red flag? You know, I uh, I was working on a project. It was a it was a mobile project, and the guys we were working for were all pretty chill, right? Um, and so they'd give us these briefs that were they were pretty vague. You know, it was kind of like, yeah, you know, make a thing. I'm like, well, you know, I could really use all this information. And then they didn't get back to us because they were all really busy. They're, they're kind of a smaller team, super busy. Um, and they just they weren't real good at getting back to us real fast. So I was like, OK, so I made a thing. And then we sent it to them. And they're like, this is awesome. And I'm like, oh, OK, cool. Well, I, you know, that's fine then. We won't, you know, we'll just kind of do it this way, you know, like whatever. Um, so, you know, a lot of, but 
for other projects, like on a Naughty Dog thing, if any of those questions, if we had any questions like that, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, for this part of the asset, I know you don't really see it, but, you know, uh, do you want to see blurry so that we don't, like, you know, waste all our detail there? Um, you have to ask Naughty Dog that. You know, you have to, you have to communicate with that. But it's kind of like, that's the decision. We'll tell you to change it later. Yep. You know, um, so it kind of goes from project to project. That's actually a really good point. Um, just in general, as producers, when you're talking to your clients, it's a really good idea to build the This helps just be very professional, be formal, not to the point of being rude, but be formal with them. And then as you get to know this client, you can learn how casual Konami boss, sir. They call me ma'am. You know, they really, they're very, very formal. So you have to stay formal with them. I have another chill guys and they send me like memes in their emails okay like really like they're funny there was there was one time that I was saying hey you haven't sent us the actual naming conventions for any of these assets could in the future could you start making sure that you add those to the JIRA task and he sent me a like a picture of Napoleon up on his thing and said it shall it has been decreed these names shall come back um, so then in response to the guy as my response to his email and that was literally just me saying, yes, I got your email, thank you. And then his producer saw that line of events, and he came back and he said, Hannah, you jest, but this is how he dresses in the office. OK. So they're a bunch of funny guys. Um, and, it, and with them, if I was also, if I came back to them and I was really formal with them, then to them it would seem like I was being rude, or I wasn't being warm with them, or, or just either that yeah, or I was. It, you know, it would be kind of a buzzkill. Yeah. Kind of thing, you know, you it's know? like they're being funny, and I was kind of like, thank you, I appreciate your urgency in this matter, you know. It's just sort of, so learn who you're talking to, learn the client, and if you behave to them the same way that they are behaving to you, it builds a rapport and it gets them to like you as a producer, which makes them more trusting and easier to work with. Um, and, we're, and we're talking about all this kind of in a, uh, you know, we're, we're relationships with clients, you know, with, uh, you know, other, you know, you know, we're a vendor there, client kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, that kind of relationship is going to happen in the industry um, all the time. I mean, even here, you know, uh, you know, you, you, your art lead needs to talk to your production lead. Well, get to know each other, know each other. So, you know, you're gonna have the lighting. I mean, you know, just in art, you're gonna have is really important. So this it, it kind of applies in that sense because they're. You know, the other teams become your clients in a sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, the last bit of this is going to be sort of just little technical things about production. Um, Excel is your friend. Never estimate its awesome power, right? There are like a bajillion tools out there for project management and whatever, but frankly, in my humble opinion, nothing really beats Excel, at least not for internal tracking. Um, at MindWalk, we do everything in Excel. Um, partially because all of our clients use something totally different. Some of them use Google for unknown reasons. Some of, some of them are using their ways to do it. If you're using Outlook, it's really, really easy. You just and group it and let you create folders and auto save to them. So make sure this is something you're doing. It sounds really silly, but it's really important. And this, the heart to heart. Producers, just think in your heads, you don't have to answer me, but why do you want to be a producer? It's really important. With artists, I don't, I mean, I don't know like, the reason why you want to be an artist, but for producers, it is very, very important because it will actually determine whether or not you are a good producer. You, it is about your team. This is honestly the most important thing that I can stress to you as a producer. Do not become a producer if it's because you like being in charge, if it's because you like telling people what to do, or even if it's because you think that you're really good at organization and project management tools and you like making lists and any of that. You have to do it because you want to support your artists and your designers and your programmers and whoever, because you want to support your team. You want to make awesome games and you want to make sure that they get done on time and correctly. That's why you need to be a producer. Because in the end, if the project goes well, it is your team's success. If the project fails, it is your fault as a producer. No matter what it is that happens, it's your fault. That's sort of how you have to think about it. It sounds really harsh that way, but it's true. So don't do this unless you want to be a support for your team. To Sean. All right, we make it look good. Um, so I kind of want to talk to you about uh, 
you know, uh, kind of get thrown into the deep end pretty hard uh, as soon as you hit the water. Um, and uh, just kind of a, you know, how, how we go about it in outsourcing, um, uh, things like that. Uh, uh, okay, so one of the first things I was always grappling with uh, when I was learning is kind of like, how long should something take me? You know, you're here and, and you're learning, you know, how to at least, you know, do it in the first place, which is good, that, you know, that's focus on that. Um, but, you know, once you start getting towards, you know, the end of, of five, yeah, and once you're getting kind of in that two to three month range of graduating, you're like, well, I'm going to need to get a job soon, so how long should this be? Um, for mobile, um, doing a simple vehicle, you know, not really any, not a lot of moving parts or anything like that, just something very simple. Um, I'm talking like five days, I made a massive shift that takes up, you know, some huge amount of screen, you know. Um, so you can get that done in five days. We mean man days. Man days, yes. That's very specifically. Um, for mind walking, it'll vary a little bit, but the standard is eight hours. When we say a day, we mean eight hours. We don't mean from 9 a.m. till 1 o'clock in the morning. We AAA, obviously this can vary a lot. You have tools and workflows, things like that, but generally what's expected um, from us at MindWalk is uh, you get that done in about 50 um, not really going to interrupt. It's going to be further off of that. Um, if you need the interior, you double um, As uh, This isn't just for artists, though. Um, for any producers in here, this is something you also have to think about. Um, that are more designers. Uh, it's cool to see the interior of the vehicle, right? Is it worth having your artist take twice as long to do it? So you have to kind of think about that. You know, you could, in theory, get twice as many things done if you don't have interiors. So, you know, those are kind of trade-offs you have to learn to make as well. Um, right, so practice making estimates. Um, you guys aren't going to hit those probably right now. I know I wasn't. Um, you know, I my first couple of weeks in uh, when I was at Mindwalk, I, I wasn't hitting the estimates I was supposed to. Uh, every time I move to a new project, I'm not hitting the estimates I'm supposed to. You know, you 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 learn new uh, new work. Each client does everything differently. I mean, we're using the same program, and you go to a different project, and they're like, oh no, but we do it this way. To do it that way, or else it's not going to look like um, what you're doing. Uh, but you do need to get a general, um, uh, and it you know some of our projects hurt a little bit because of it because we're like, uh, I don't know. It's, you know, this is everyone's making games for the first time here. Um, so one of the only ways to do that is to start tracking it. Um, this isn't necessarily a track, track it and be like, it's done fast enough and beat yourself over the head about it. It's start learning, you know, start saying, you know, track it while you're working. Um, there's programs like Manic Time out there that can, I mean, just track how long it's taking you. Um, without and, interrupting your workflow. Yeah, without interrupting your workflow. Uh, and, and that's really important, obviously. You guys have like, a, and classes on top of it. So, uh, on top of that, you know, your producer obviously wants to know because they're trying to plan out, you know, your games for the first time. Comes to you and says, "How long do you think that will take?" I don't know is not an acceptable answer. Yeah. Um, so please never so say that to your producer. You can't say I don't know. So you have to give them something, but you don't want to just give them some shot out of left field for, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's essentially I don't know. Um, it took me like five hours. That is. So, high poly. Generate that and do it in substance. You know, I, I wait till and get it. Get it some other way. You can get a similar result in different ways. Um, 
when you get on a certain projects, you don't get to make choices like that. Uh, you know, we're working for Naughty Dog, we, you know, um, which is totally cool. You know, and that's how they do it. And so you got to figure out how to do it that way, and you learn how to do it that way. Um, so sometimes you don't really get that choice, but for now, like as you're doing things, um, there is usually some better way to do it, and you need to keep discovering that for yourself. Um, so, and kind of one of the only ways you'll become aware of that is if you start tracking your time. Um, I didn't do that and it killed me. Uh, my first two weeks on the job were brutal. Because <laughs> um, I got there and they said, uh, you have to make this um, destroyed at in seven days. Um, good luck. And I'm like, Wow, you know, I'm like, oh, oh, well, this will be cool. Oh, I'll, I'll like work on this for like three weeks or something. Yeah, it'll be awesome. Uh, and they're like seven days out of the week-ish, you know, kind of thing. I was like, oh, um, you know, and, and you don't really want to spend your, you know, your first week on the, on the job doing, you know, hours and hours and hours of overtime. So you learn really, really fast how to do something faster. Um, so that's kind of. Uh, Get a jump start on that. Yeah, try and get a jump start start on that if you can. Um, you know, just it, it's all about just starting to you know pay attention to it. You know, you start taking data from it. You know, and stuff like that. Um, you you know you can't make any adjustments if you just don't have any information on what you're trying to deal with. Uh, so that's one big recommendation of mine. Um, the other thing is that uh, once you get into industry. Um, you're going to be surrounded by a bunch of people that know way more than you do. So you're going to instantly get faster no matter what as soon as you get a job. It's pretty mind-blowing. Um, within that first week, I was already at least twice as fast at doing just about everything. Um, and in six months, I was pretty much a completely different artist. Um, it, it really doesn't take long. Um, and, and I couldn't even talk to the people <laughs> that I was around, right? They're all... Chinese, but I just, you know, be like, oh god, I might, you know, just take a take a quick break. And I'd look around and I'd see some guy pressing buttons I'd never seen before, and I'm like, what, what is that guy doing? And I just kind of watch him, and he look at me and goes, hmm. yeah, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then I just keep walking and be like, okay, crazy white guy, yeah. <laughs> and then you know, he'd go back to what he's doing, and I'd watch him and I and I'd learn about six new things in five minutes, and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that hot menu even existed. Cool. You know, I just had to sit there and look over his shoulder and watch him press it five times. Um, so, so just being around people is obviously extremely useful, um, which is one thing for all you artists here. You have a giant bank of people around you, and you're all kind of learning, and everyone's going to be learning different things. So just make sure you're talking. You know, talk and watch each other work, and don't try and keep your own work to yourself and be like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. Don't watch me. You know, because you know something someone else doesn't. Period. Because you've all looked at different internets and different websites and you know watched a different tutorial here and there. You know you well, easy if I know on top of the industry too. Because uh, it's it's a difficult thing, especially when you because you're basically going up to someone and being like, hey, I, I kind of feel like I suck and I don't know things. Can you tell me what you do instead? And that's sometimes kind of hard, you know, when really it's just, hey, what you doing? And they're like, oh, I'm doing this thing. And you're like, oh, I just wanted something. Thank you. And you walk away. You know? And it's just like, but you have to get used to doing that because it's going to feel like, you know, it, it, you know you're going to feel weird about it, you know? Um, so so kind of get in the habit of, of just talking to each other about your processes. Um, why that next? Let me move on. Ah, designers. You'll ruin everything. Um, but I say that in the most loving way possible. We love you for ruining everything. Um, making games is an iterative process. You're going to make something. The designer's going to be like, yeah, but I wanted to do this. And you're like, OK. Um, and everything has to change because you know they don't always know like how you did something. And so they don't know that that new thing they wanted to do is going to completely change how you did it, you know, you're going to have to redo this whole thing, they, they might not get that, but you know, you tell them, you talk to them, transparency and diplomacy, right, you're like, 
hey, so I know you really like that thing, but how important is it to you? Because we made these 10 things, and now that's going to make us have to redo it all this different way. So do you really want it? Because now we might not be able to do this other thing. And then they're like, oh, well, no. Or yes, let's do that. It'll be worth it. Um, so you know, you're, you're giving them information, and then they're maybe bit able to make better choices. But it is not completely on the designer. Um, as an artist, and I'm sure Nick has started to, depending on where you are in your cohort at this time, has either just started to drill it into you, or you think about it in your sleep. Um, Non-destructive workflows. Uh, everyone, I'm sure, is like learning about substance. We're doing substance work here a little bit. Next semester. OK, <laughs> all right. Substance, pay attention to that. Um, it'll inform the way you do art and everything else um, from now on. Um, Basically, the concept of a non-destructive workflow is where it's at. Um, everything you do, you need to think, if I had to do this again, like if I had to change this, how long is that going to take me? Is it going to take me a really long time, or is this going to be really easy to change? You know, you, you, you paint some stuff into Photoshop, you know, you're painting in rust or something like that. You've got, you know, nice, you know, shadowing and stuff on it and like, I don't know bunch of effects going around on it, something like that. Um, uh, they want the rust on the bottom now, because or, or on the top, because this thing's hanging from its legs now. You know, and there you're like, now I have to go repaint all that rust. Or did you use masks and materials and you know repeating patterns and pull that stuff in, or you know use a use a baked map, you know a, a position map to like you know bring in. Uh, to bring in your rust on you know a certain position of the item, and so now really all you have to do is go turn the item, uh, go turn the asset in 3D space, and then hit a rebake button, and then go replace a few masks. Um, you know that's a non-destructive workflow suddenly. Uh, whereas this other guy is going to have to take about three days to go repaint all his rust. So just start trying to think about if you have to redo it, if you, if someone needs a change made. Um, how long is that change going to take you to, to make? So, when you you know you're talking about your workflow, you know we're we're talking about a uh, you know your process, um, going over it, trying to get it to go faster. Um, this is part of it. Sometimes it'll take a little longer to do it in a non-destructive way, but uh, it it can be worth it at the end game because it will change. Something will change on it. Yes. This guy won't like it. This guy will like it. They come to, you know, you're getting two different feedbacks or something. You know, you need to change a little thing here, change a thing there, get rid of that, bring it back. You know, oh, wait, yeah, move it, move it two inches to the right. Okay. No, move it back to the left. Okay. No, yeah, no, yeah, okay. Make up your mind. No. <laughs> um, so, One know. good example is that uh, for Uncharted 4, we were making curtains, right? It's a really simple asset. You just throw it in Marvelous Designer and let it simulate, and then you make it. But um, because of a series of unfortunate events, we were running out of time on this asset. And we were like, hey, client, we have a way that we can make this about five days faster if you let us triangulate the mesh. Can we triangulate it, or will that mess it up? And the honest on the Naughty Dog side was like, I don't know. The designers keep changing stuff. They're probably going to come tell us that they want Nate to like lick it, so it might need to animate. And we were like, OK, then so you know, it's going to take us like an extra three to five days to do it this way. And they said, OK, it's worth it just in case. And so we did. There was another instance, though, um, in which we did. Did any of you guys see the E3 demo for Uncharted 4? OK. You know in the very beginning, when they're like running through the market and there's fruit flying everywhere? <laughs> they didn't used to fly around. When we first made those, we literally made meshed piles of fruits. And the designers were like, oh, but wouldn't it be cool if when you shot it, fruit flew everywhere? And the artists were like, it would be so cool. Let us go change everything. Oh. So we had to do that. And we had to redo, I think it was like 15 different fruit assets because the designers were like, oh, we're going to change it. And we were like, OK, clients, just so you know, it's going to take us this long. And they're like, yep, we know. Blame the designers. So it will happen. So it happens. Um, but you know, again, but that, that E3 fruit, demo, that, that was cool. It was pretty damn cool. Right? So it was totally you know, worth it. You got to. You know, it, it's worth it. You know, things are going to change. They're going to have new ideas as you're trying to like make stuff and 
it's going to be real easy to get mad at them or something like that, but don't. Just try and work in a way where it, you make it as easy as possible on yourself to make those changes. Um, it's very important to do that because you cannot exist in this industry without things changing on you. So if you make something, you're like, it's perfect. This is my Michael. They're like, oh, but now we don't want it to have a head. And you're like, why? <laughs> and then, yeah, so it's just like, you, you, won't, you won't be able to function properly if you can't deal with having to go back and change things. Um, so again, make it as easy on yourself as possible. Uh, you know, and also, that's a, another thing that's a little off script, but nothing you make is sacred, okay? Someone else will even come in and be like, yeah, we want a broken one, so we're just gonna shatter it and put textures randomly on the inside of it, and shatter it, so you're like, that's not what I made, but okay. <laughs> Um, so learn to learn to handle that. Okay, play the games you want to make. Keep playing games. Um, you guys are super busy. Uh, it doesn't really stop. You stay busy all the time. Um, if it's not one thing, it's another. You know, even you're like, oh yeah, you know, I'll get out. You know, I'm, you know, doing like 14, 16 hours at FIO, but you know, I'll get my job, and then it'll be like at least somewhat a nine to five and sometimes I'll crunch and work an extra, you know, two or three hours and it's like, okay, yeah, but now you've also got, you know, bills, other bills to pay, you've got other life things start happening, uh, you know, it's just, life kind of picks up in different ways and so now your balance of time is even, even less, you, you start having less, you, you're, you're doing less work and still have less time at the end of the day. Um, it kind of happens. So you need to make sure that you don't stop playing games if you're in this or else you'll kind of, it, you, you may lose your love for it. Um, but, you know, and it's also just like, relax, play some games. Um, but also, when you play games, especially the ones you really like, don't just play them, study them. Um, and, I, and I'm not necessarily talking about like, get out your notebook, and sit down, and okay, they use this many, I think they use this many, I see, I see these things on it, and you know, take notes. I mean, if you're into that, go for it. But, that, that's not really what I'm talking about. It's, you know, it, I, I was playing Borderlands and you know I'm playing with my brother and he's going around killing things and I'm running around I'm like yeah let's go get him and then I see this like kind of a neat thing and I'm just like oh how do they do that and, you know I just kind of like start looking around and he's like boom 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 dude I'm dying and I'm like what oh oh and he's like halfway across the map now because I'm sitting here looking at polygons and you know where they decided to cheat and that's one of the best things to look at is play your favorite games, your huge titles, and look at where they cheated. Um, that's gonna tell you so much. Uh, we, so we're doing stuff for Naughty Dog Crunch Harder 4. I, they don't cheat, period. Everything is immaculate, it's Perfect. not really, but it's, it, that's what they go for, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they cheat as little as possible. Um, I mean, you know, it's like, you could just make this wall and reuse this other texture and kind of fit it to it, or we could make the wall into some beautiful sculpture. Well, we make the wall into a beautiful sculpture because it's Uncharted 4, and that's just how they do things. They've got this massive budget, they're making this massive game, you know, one of the top AAA games in the, you know, fucking industry. Um, so they don't cheat, really. They're like, that scene doesn't belong there, and texture resolution is the same all over the thing. We will add more textures onto it instead of cheating. You know, they, they, that, that's more important to them. Whereas you go with Borderlands and there's a seam sitting there and you're just like, that is a seam on the front of your thing. And it's like, but it's okay because it's Borderlands. And not to say that Borderlands is less of a game than Uncharted, but it's just, that's the style and what are values of Borderlands? And that's cool. You know, they, you know, they, they make something and it's sitting on the ground and the bottom of it has almost no texture root resolution because that's where they cheat. They want to put all their texture res resolution into other things, you know, in the 80 gazillion guns they have, right? Um, so going through and, and finding out where each game cheats and figuring out how they cheated, first of all, you'll learn a lot because you're like, I never thought of that. Yeah, that is a good way to get twice as much texture resolution out of this thing I'm making. Um, and also, you'll, so you'll learn a little bit and you'll learn a little bit about the games you're make, that they're making. Um, you'll learn a little bit about the mentality at different companies, you know, uh, things like that, and you, it, and, you know, that, that's kind of something you guys, I know we're gonna come out of here and you're like, I just want a job, you know? <laughs> I gotta pay off my student loans, I just want a job. And it's like, yeah, I, I know what you mean. 
Um, but you, you do also kind of want to think about well, where do I want to work? You know, maybe it's not exactly where I end up first because you need that job, but the second place you want to work at, you know, in three to five years, like where, where is it you want to work at? You know, where, what, what games do you love? What games do you want to make? Go, go play those games and study them. Look at, oh, this is where they cheat on polygons. This is where they cheat on textures. This is, they make all of this really awesome. This, you know, they do a bunch of repetition here. They don't repeat things at all. Um, and that'll inform you about, a little bit at least, about how their art team also functions and sort of values within their art team. Um, because it's been interesting working on outsourcing because uh, I've worked for three companies on three different games in two years. Most of my friends are on their first game at their first company, period, and they haven't finished it yet. Um, so they're, you know, and, it, and it's super cool. It's still super cool, um, obviously. But uh, you know, I, I've kind of gotten my, I've, I've gotten to dip my toe into a few different places, essentially, and seen, uh, you know, Naughty Dog's cool, and you know, I love their art, but I like cheating on my art a little bit. That's something I enjoy doing. It's a I find it's its own creative problem solving, right? And they don't do that. And it's, you know, that's cool, but it's it's not what I like to do for a living. You know, I like to figure out how to cheat on, on game art. Um, it's a fun thing for me. So, you know, maybe I want to go work at, you know, somewhere else, right? Um, so, it, you know, I've, I've kind of gotten to, like I said, dip my toe into water in a few places. Um, so that's one thing that's been neat about the Broaden your inspirational horizon. Knowledge is artistic power, and it really is. Um, so this is kind of a okay. So we we're tracking our time. You know, we're we've got our art to the point where we're uh, kind of using those artistic principles somewhat subconsciously. You know, we're looking at silhouettes and values and stuff pretty much just as second nature, um, and uh, you know, we're kind of seeing, you know, learning how to manipulate how we make these assets and things. Um, so now you need to, so that's kind of your first tier of artist. Your second tier is the guy who really knows what he's talking about, about an asset. Not just in terms of how to make it, but in terms of the actual object. Um, this is going to be told better through an example. Um, so we were, for Uncharted 4, we were working on boat. And uh, my coworker, she was doing the uh, she was doing the engine, you know, just kind of basic four stroke engine for the boat. And she called me over and she's like, "Hey, can you take a look at this?" Um, and I was like, "Sure, you know, PC, just feedback, throw feedback on." And so I take a look at it and I'm like, "Hmm, something seems off about this." She never really lived around boats. My parents have always had a boat. I I don't know. I've always been around boats. I've seen lots of boats. Um, so I was able to see really quickly that something was off. I was like, "Oh." your grind's in the wrong places, you know? Because it's like, okay, well, I know that the grind goes here because you, know, you hit logs and stuff like that, and you know, this is where you step on it and stuff like that, or uh, you know, there should be material separation here, um, whereas there it was all one material because she didn't realize that was the lid to look inside the boat motor, you know, stuff like that. Um, so essentially this is kind of a start learning about what you're making. Um, this is doubly true for any kind of mechanical or moving object. Um, any, anything that has like a, a function to it, learn about that function. Um, because, you know, to go, you know, you need to learn about that so you can make one properly, but then also to make the sci-fi one or the fantasy one or the one that's kind of in some weird Greco-Roman time travel thing or something, right? Um, you know, you, you understand how this works so now when you need to make the sci-fi one, you know where all the pistons or the hoses are kind of supposed to be, or that at least you need a hose. You know, you don't have to know how to like make a blueprint of this thing, but there should be some hoses coming from here and there should be pistons, right? Um, now you just make them electromagnetic floating pistons and laser hoses or something, right? Uh, so, and that suddenly becomes very convincing and becomes, you know, oh, the player's like, oh, that's, that if that existed, that I think that's what it would look like. Um, that's so. also true, not just um, not just artists, producers, 
know stuff about stuff also, you'd be surprised at how helpful you can be to artists, really. Like, just because you're not an artist doesn't really mean that you can't give them feedback or be helpful. Obviously, don't force your opinion on them because they probably know better than you. But for example, again, for Uncharted 4, we were making a blacksmithing uh, workshop. And they had this thing that was like a, it just looked like a wall with a bunch of coals and a hood on it. And the artists were making that, and they were like, what on earth is this hood thing? And I went over there, and I have never smithed anything in my life. But just because I've been curious about it, I've looked up how to do it and, and things about it. And I was like, oh, that actually needs to be a chimney. So it needs to, it's not just a hood, but it needs to continue up and be a chimney. And the artists were like, oh my god, that makes so much sense. You know, so like, don't think that as a producer, because you're not an artist, you can't be helpful. It is also important that you know things like that as well. Uh, and, and you start, you know, for any of the designers too, you obviously yes. you start being able to like make uh, cool mechanics decisions, and... maybe mechanics based off of stuff you know, you know, so mm -hmm. like she said, no stuff about stuff. It's not a waste of time to go read up on something about, yeah. you know, on Wikipedia. Just go Wikipedia like crazy. Yeah. Uh, read the brief. Okay, so we get briefs. Um, uh, think of it kind of like an assignment. Um, uh, basically, they the client makes a brief on something, and basically, it's it's the it's all the technical information we need to know about this asset: number of polys, size of the textures, number of textures, uh, textile density. Uh, if we're so fortunate, how it's going to be in used in game, <laughs> um, and then they show us pictures. You know, they they say this is. This is the thing, except we want this on it with this and this and this and this and this, and you know it's all pointing and called out and all this stuff, right? Um, and then they send us a block mesh of this is how big it should be, and this is kind of like the space it needs to fill. Sometimes, right? Sometimes, um, if we're lucky. Uh, so one thing that happens a lot is an artist will get that and see the pictures and go to work, you know, and they don't really think about. Oh well, it needs to have this textile density, so I need that means I have to mirror it, which means I need to put something over to hide that seam. So I need to like make it in this way, you know, and stuff like that. So it's like it's really tempting to get a thing and start making it because that's the that's the fucking cool part, you know, making stuff, um, you know, getting it in ZBrush, and sculpting it, and then coloring it with the, the textures and everything, but. You know, then you get to the end and you're like, oh, but it needs double the texture density, but I can't do that without just doubling the texture. But I only get this size of the texture, and well, now it's like an over budget asset by like, whoa, and now I have to go redo it because you got a little trigger happy. Um, so stop, take a breath, look at the thing you got to make, think about it for a minute. I, it's going to look like you're wasting time, and it's going to kind of feel like it. <laughs> uh, and it's going to feel like you're kind of wasting time. You're just, just going to be like, okay, okay. You know, but plan it. Plan what you're going to do. It's, it is so important. I mean, every time I start an asset, I spend about an, almost an hour just kind of like thinking about and spending time kind of just like toying around with things, you know, just making some rough meshes just to kind of be like, okay, this is kind of what I want to do. Or, you know, I'll look at it and I'll pull it into Photoshop and I'll make some notations like, oh, this wall can only have this, but it's got this big relief on it. Okay, well, what's important about this? Well, it's got a face on it, so that's really important. So any polygons I have need to go around that face, right? Because you look at something, you're like, that's a face, I'm gonna look at that. Um, so, you know, it's got a face on it, you need to have huge poly concentration there. Okay, well, the character walks up through this area. Okay, so that means this part of the wall right here needs to have a bunch of textile density too. But everything, but now once it gets out towards here, I can start cutting that down because it's in shadow, it's really narrowly lit. You know, he just kind of walks through this hallway and sees this, you know, wall relief sculpture thing, you know, off to the side. So now I have a plan, right? And I'm like, cool, now I can start working on this and I can spend a bunch of polys here and know that that's okay and then kind of spread it out and get larger and you know more vague mm -hmm. polygons out towards the fringes and edges, right? Um, so, but if I just started, I would have made it all the, te the density I needed for the face, and then I would have had to spend more time going back and decimating and you know doing all this stuff, so it would have added on you know two to three hours at least onto this asset, and now the asset might be behind and it kind of just 
roller coasters, you know. Or this is whatever. this is also relevant for producers too, um, especially if you're in outsourcing or any any place that actually uses briefs. If you're that artist producer, read their brief also so that you know what it is that they're trying to accomplish. That will help you not only on timing um, in terms of like, wow, that's really complicated. So let me talk to them about how long that's going to take. Or even sometimes the opposite, where they're like, that's pretty simple. Let me make sure he's not going to spend forever on that. Um, it's also things like, especially in outsourcing, as the producer, you are the last QC gate before that goes to the client. And there are some things that even I have caught because I've read the brief in it. For example, there was one game we were making Christmas ornaments. And the brief said, make three different you know, colors of Christmas ornaments, or three, di three different designs. But what happened was that it was translated in such a way, it wasn't even the translator's fault, it's just because of how the language of Chinese works, that it sounded to the artist like it meant have three different patterns on one. And so like, you know, like it's like a star and a candy cane and a snowman or something, instead of like, this one has stars, this one has snowmen, and this one has candy canes. Um, so when I went to go send it out and there was only one ornament, I was like, uh oh. Hey guys, what does this brief say? And so I went over and I talked to the artist about it and with the translator and I was like, this is actually what they meant on the brief. And they were like, oh, and then they fixed it really fast. And we were able to fix it really fast because of Sean's non-destructive workflow. So hey. yeah. So there you go. So it's important for everyone really to read the brief. Um, and that's also kind of runs around again to talk to your friends, talk to your coworkers. I mean, you know, you got an asset and you're like, who? I don't really know the best way to attack this. Well, maybe someone around has done it before. Go talk to them. Be like, what's your opinion on this? Talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very useful. Um, oh, and if you're making the brief, uh, team leads, designers, things like that, um, this is just as important. So they can't read the brief if you didn't really make one or put all the information on it that it needs. Um, and this is this is really important. I, I remember on our on our capstones, we didn't really have anything. We were just like, I don't know, we're just making stuff because we got review next week, you know. So just get the game done. Um, this is incredibly important even now. Um, not just because it's like, oh well, it's a best practice. Um, it's that it's going to focus you. It's going to focus the team, and everyone's going to know exactly what you're making. You know, you so you sit there and you're like. Cool, we just had this art meeting. Design, is this stuff cool? Design's like, yeah. And you're like, cool. Uh, who, however your team's set up, someone makes you know, briefs for the assets. You know, make them, actually make them. Make an official brief. This is a brief for this asset. You know, get all the information for the asset, put it down because you know, now you have to make a decision on things. You know, as a lead, you have to make a decision on something. You have to say, well, how important is this? How many polys do we want to put to it? You know, don't just say, make it and we'll figure it out later. You know, be like, well, this is important. Okay, so we're gonna put a lot of polys on this. So now your artist knows, ah, I'm putting a lot of polys on this. I can kind of go crazy. You know, if you don't do that, then they're gonna go crazy anyways. And you're like, but I need to duplicate this 200 times. Why did you go crazy on this? Well, you didn't tell me not to, you know? <laughs> so make decisions, get focused. You know, it really, really helps. And, your designers can look at it and be like, oh, wait, why are they doing that? This thing's gotta move, you know? And then you, you know, designer goes and goes, hey, this needs to move. And you're like, oh, I'm gonna go change that. And then hopefully you can catch some things before they get too far, right? Um, so, whereas I remember when we were doing ours, <laughs> we just had a, we, we, we had a folder on the server somewhere and there's just stuff that needed to get done and there's this JPEG stuff that needed to get done, and it was just someone would draw a doodle and then name it, and it would just be in there, and it's just like a thing that needs to get done, and there was zero other information. Um, so we had pixel density variation, we had all sorts of stuff all over the game, right? And then that just kind of looks bad, you know? Um, so talk about this kind of thing, get it decided, be like, what kind of pixel density do we want on our game on screen? You know, I mean, uh, I didn't really even know a lot about Tesla density in the first place because we were just like, uh, yeah, Nick, Tesla density. I'm just going to make the thing. So like, <laughs> you know, like, whatever, I don't care. And then we get into the game and it's like, well, that thing's a little blurry and that thing, that thing's sharp as hell. And now together, they both look awful because they don't match, right? Um, and it, so you know, it's like, okay, well, are we using 4K maps on everything? No. 
So you know, when you have an object and it's like, well, it's going to be this big on screen, make it that big in Maya, and then figure out your texel density properly. You know, uh, it's just, but you can't do that unless someone's made the decision. You know, um, so make a brief, put the information on it. It's a useful habit. Okay, cool. So that's art stuff. Um, we're going to kind of talk about some general outsourcing things. Um, and why it's not as scary and foreign as it might seem. Um, so one thing to know is that we talk about outsourcing and I, everyone instantly is like, oh, well, all the Chinese outsourcers. There are a ton of outsourcers in the US as well. Um, so this isn't just in terms of move to China and go work in outsourcing because it's cool. Um, there's, I mean, it's also an option here. There, there are, you know, they, they, they outsource, you know, design elements even, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Entire levels get outsourced into the U.S. as well to just other little side companies, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they're not very well known because they're not the big name, and so you have to do a little hunting. But uh, I think there was one here in Orlando. It's like Dark Side Games or something like that. Or not in Orlando, but in Florida somewhere. Uh, um, that's actually in uh, Sunrise near Fort Lauderdale. Uh, but I think they went out of business because they were trying to do something with Microsoft. Oh, wow. Well, good job. Well, then don't work for them, but somebody else. <laughs> but anyways, you get the idea. So um, they're, they're around. You know, you just got to do a little bit of digging for it. Um, so, you know, don't instantly think, oh, well, I'm sure as hell not moving to China. Uh, so this is kind of just, you know, not very interesting for me. Another thing to keep in mind too, um, I know that when I was in school at SCAD, whenever somebody mentioned outsourcing, it was kind of like, ugh, outsourcing. You know, and there's a lot of games, gamers even, um, in forums and things that are like, oh, well, that company outsources. Let me tell you how many companies outsource, you guys. There are very few, quote unquote, sacred companies that do zero outsourcing at all. Everyone does. And even then, they probably do it and they just don't tell you about they just, it. Yeah, they just don't talk about it. So like, really, like you saw all of the games that we, that we had up there on Mindwalk, and that's a lot of different companies. You know? So it's, it's not like some dirty thing that they're like, oh, they outsource. It's not like that. Um, there are even some artists in the industry who will be like, oh, well, we hate outsourcers because whatever. And we're like, OK, but you haven't seen our side of the thing. So um, don't look at this and be like, ew, outsourcing. Seriously think about it, because it's been awesome for us. OK, money. Um, nobody talks about this ever, because it is taboo as hell. Um, so we're going to talk about it, because we're like that. Yep. Uh, so we're obviously not going to talk about actual numbers, because you can't actually talk about that. Because that really is taboo. Because yeah, that is really taboo, uh, like NDA kind of taboo. But we can talk about in relative and general terms. So one of the biggest things in outsourcing um, is that, that everybody assumes is that, like, oh, well, you can outsource to China because it's cheap labor. You're right, it is cheap labor, even for us. So the thing is that, like, yes, if you, if you move to China or to India or to Germany or any of the places that are big outsourcers, you will probably be making less money than you would be in the States. But like that says, let's talk about how cheap it is to live in China. Really. Yeah. His um, breakfast? Costs 50 cents. 50 cents. And it's a, it's a pretty filling breakfast. It's like a big, like, like biscuit. Every morning, you know. Yeah. So it's just like. You know, and, th and that's like, what are, I go out all the time, you know, and it's all this stuff. Yeah, you know, and we still save half of our income and don't touch it. And we're Literally, paying yeah. off student loans at, you know, rapid rates and all these things, you know, <laughs> and it's just like, because of the cost of living, sure, we don't make a whole lot in comparison, but, you know, we're, we're living all right. We're still able to pay we're off student loans. Hut yeah, we're still able you know, to pay off student loans. We're still able to save money. <laughs> Um, we're still able to, like, saving and student loans or whatever, we're living in a nice apartment that in San Francisco, by the way, would be absolutely unaffordable yeah. for us. Even, even working on, like, the standard U.S. salary for these things, you wouldn't, wouldn't be able to live in that nice of an apartment. Um, and we have it. We don't cook because we don't like to, and we go out to eat all the time, and we have the money to do that. We are living comfortably. You know, we're not, like, crazy spending money buying Ferraris, whatever, but we're comfortable and we're happy, you know. So keep that in mind that just because you're living in a place that, that, and that's also, again, true for not just outsourcing, but wherever you go. Mm -hmm. Think about cost of living. It's a really big part of what your salary actually means. Yep. Um, so, and, and, I, and I guess that's one kind of uh, misnomer, I don't know, whatever, that we, uh, I want to like break for everyone real quick. 
Um, a lot of people, even in industry, they don't really know, they don't get it, because they just talk to people on Skype and email. You know, they don't, they don't see anything. Um, they, uh, you know, they basically <laughs> just think, oh yeah, we just like give all this stuff to these Chinese outsourcers and they work their little fingers off for like no money, you know, and then they, you know, go take it home to their parents or something. Um, a lot of these guys that are working there are considered to have like, I mean, these are really good jobs, mm -hmm. right? Um, and 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 they they live well, you know, as well. So mm -hmm. it's you know, and they, and they don't work crazy crazy overtime all the time. I mean, it's like it's it's about like any other studio. When the project you're on goes into crunch, you often start crunching a little bit too, you mm -hmm. know. Because um, you still have to meet their deadlines. Yeah, you still have to meet their deadlines. Um, sometimes, depending on the company, it's actually a little, you get a little bit better under the stick because a lot of times they're like, you know, we're going into crunch, we need to send you more things. And then my lovely producer or my boss goes, well, you're going to have to hire more artists, aren't you? And they're <laughs> like, yeah, sure, whatever. And they, you know, they're just like, put more artists on the team. So then I work maybe an extra hour every day, but we have like five more new artists. Which gets our company a lot more money. And then, Yay. And then we get through crunch. You know, and I'm just like, cool. You know, I, that was my crunch. <laughs> you know, it was like I, I stayed a little later. Um, so it's just, I don't know. There's just, I think there's like this this kind of general image of things that I, I just kind of wanted to break up a little bit. Cool. Also, this is another big thing. They took her gerbs. Okay. That's another big stigma that outsourcing gets is everyone's like, oh, well, the reason why we don't have jobs here in the States is because they're outsourcing them all to China. They're really not, you guys. Like, come on. OK, like the big thing is that, like, yeah, one of the main reasons why companies outsource is because it is cheaper. They have million dollar budgets, but that's still not big enough because of the games that we're making. And this is all talking about AAA and stuff. But we're also talking about Sorry. mobile games as well, right? Um, we get outsourced as many mobile games as anything else because they've got teams of like two dudes, but they want to make this really big game. And, they're, and so they've got a. And they're on a shoestring budget. Yep, a really tiny budget. They've got no money. And they're like, well, I still want to make this game. Right. Can you help me with the art that is uh, sometimes can be considered essentially monkey work? You know, it's mm -hmm. it's so, you know sometimes that we we get a project and it's all just kind of it's really basic stuff. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That's what we're here for is to kind of do the basic stuff. That's that's part of what outsourcing is. Mm -hmm. um, we also get complicated stuff. Yep. Um, you know, we we don't we also get of, hero assets. Like, don't think that you would go to outsourcing and be like, I will make trash cans all day every day. That's not what it is. Like. For example, I wish I should have put a picture in here, but um, Mindwalk actually worked on Dante's Inferno. You know, it's one of the characters we made, Dante. <laughs> Not even kidding, you guys. Uh, we also made I forget his oh, name, we made, but uh, we made like we I, bad hell guy, devil, Satan. the we devil guy. Satan. We made Satan. <laughs> yeah, we made like Pleblios. We made um, Cleopatra. <laughs> I mean, like really, we made like a lot of a lot of the characters. Yeah. Um, for Dead Space Three, we didn't make Isaac, but we made a bunch of his armor. You know. Um, so there's there's a lot of stuff that we do that's yeah. that's big big characters and so, hero animations and all this stuff. So yeah, so yeah, sorry. That's when I say monkey work. Um, I need to clarify, and I don't mean just making trash cans and bundles of sticks and damaged concrete underscore zero zero two. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about basically it doesn't take intense critical thinking and problem solving mm -hmm. and a massive amount of creative, you know, uh, basically like concept art level, like, you know, idea stuff. Okay, like you're not, you're not just coming up with the idea and making it. Um, or, you know, it doesn't take, you know, engine work. You know, it, do, it doesn't have to be completely integrated with the engine. Uh, I'm talking about basically like props and, you know, just making the character, you know, if it's kind of a, a basic character in terms of it doesn't have crazy engine stuff going on with it or something like that. That's what I mean by monkey work. Um, yeah. Can we take a few questions because we need to wrap up? Oh, is sure. it? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Let's. Uh, we can click through this real fast. Um, we're not taking your jobs. They'll hire you too. Yay. Um, good things. Good reasons to work in outsourcing. These are some of the um, people that I've been working with in production. I'm on a first name basis with all these companies, and these are just the ones that I can actually tell you about. There's like at least five others that are huge companies that I know you've heard of that I can't actually say yet because the game hasn't released. Right. 
So just because you work in outsourcing doesn't mean that you're not making connections with all of these people. Because I can come back to the States and be like, hey, those guys at ArenaNet, they love me. So I just have to be like, hey, ArenaNet, do you need another producer? And they'll be like, yeah, we know you. And we know that you do good work. So there you go. Yeah, what I've learned. Um, things that we can all talk about and things. That was Sean. I don't know what you wanted to say there. No, we kind of talked about that already. We talked about that too. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's important. Sean's seen Star Wars 2,348 times. Yeah, so when you get work about an IP, you really get to know that IP. Yep. It's <laughs> kind of a fun little side bit. Um, yep, this is uh, basically talking about when you go to China or you go to another country, there's a lot of new cool crazy stuff that you learn. Your visual library will expand crazy. We've seen the end of times. The pollution does get as bad as you see it on the internet. Basically, so we actually know what the yeah we know what it looks and like. I live it, so right. if I ever work on a post-op game, it's going to be cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, um, I I have a feeling this is where a lot of the questions are going to come from about working abroad and what that's like. Um, so go ahead and Ask go. Away. Yeah. Questions. Shoot. Go for it. Three to five days is post concept. Right. But and does that include <laughs> milestones back and forth with the client? Uh yeah, feedback. Um feedback time. Um yeah, we kind of depending on the asset, so uh we kind of tag about a half day for mobile uh, mobile items um onto any estimate we give for feedback. Um and uh so we send it in and pretty much it's like we're guaranteeing you more or less that what we send you, whatever you say about it, it should take us about a half day to fix that. Because mm -hmm. it should be at the point where that's about it's as much feedback yeah, you close need enough. to give us. That's another um, really good point, actually, to know when working in outsourcing or working anywhere that is remote, even, is you've got to keep in mind that feedback time. Because no matter what, there are some things that will slip through the cracks that we're like, look, we made it exactly like the brief said. And they're like, right, but it actually needs to be green now. And that's the kind of thing where like, if you worked in that studio, they could just be walking by and be like, oh, make that green. And you're like, oh, OK. But because we work in outsourcing and we're literally 13 hours away, it takes 13 hours to make that change, at least. So keep that in mind. Uh, yeah. Next. So, uh, and another question? Yeah. Um, as Americans, what, is, like, what are like, the mechanics of you guys working in China? Are you like, contractors? Or are you employees of the company? Like, how does that work? We are full-time employees of Mindwalk Studios. Yep. They do. Um, one of the really cool things, and this is not necessarily true about other outsourcing companies. I yeah, can't speak way, for we, them. We can only give you, like, we can only speak for yeah. Yeah, MindWalk. MindWalk. But with MindWalk, the way that they work when, when MindWalk hires you, which, by the way, so that you all know, MindWalk is actively looking for both producers and artists that are Western, specifically Western artists and producers. Um, so if you're interested, talk to us about it. Um, one of the things that MindWalk will do is when they offer you the job, you get third, uh, three months probation, in which, during which they'll pay for your visa, they pay for your housing, they pay for your travel expenses. Um, and after that three months, then they apply, they apply and cover the expenses of your full-time work visa. Um, you'll start having to get your own apartment and things like that. Um, but they will also do a lot of assistance where like, neither he or I speak Chinese, uh, speak Mandarin at all. Um, we can like order food or a restaurant, and that's about it. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want two of those. Um, that's about all we have. So, but the work has um, translators that we can call even outside of work. Like when our electricity gets turned off randomly on a weekend, we're like, oh my God, Rebecca, they just turned off our electricity. What do we do? And she's like, just put me on the phone with them and then I'll handle it. You know, so um, yeah, there, there are definitely some things, don't get me wrong, that are difficult because we don't speak the language or because we're foreigners. But MindWalk, at least, really takes care of its, of its lawai, is what they're called, of its foreigners. So any others? Oh, come on. Yes. We're in Beijing, just like right in central Beijing. Yes. How much design work do you guys do? Because we talk a lot about the art and then you get stuff more on the project management side, but how much is like, or is it mostly companies have the designers that give you things? That, that's mostly that's how it works. Um, for MindWalk, they, anyway. Yeah, for MindWalk, anyways. Um, there are outsources that they, they have, have, you know, they have teams, they have, you know, level designers and stuff in there. Those are, Generally, more like Western outsourcers. Um, uh, 
Oh, one thing, though, that MindWalk does, uh, it's not like game mechanics and design like that, but we are sometimes given whole levels that we do. For example, one of, I think it was in Forza 5, there was a level that was like something park that had like the baseball park in it and like this big open whatever. That level was, if I'm not mistaken, entirely done by MindWalk. Like they sent us the engine and we actually worked an engine, we made all the assets for it and we set it up and we got to make a lot of the actual important level design decisions and things like that. So it's, it's not just At least in terms art of assets. Dressing. Yeah, set dressing and things like that. Box, yep. You know, our white bottom, our, um, one of those boxes. Good, yeah, one of those boxes. They gave us a weird box and pretty much filled it out completely. Mm -hmm. um, so that included a lot of visual design on our end, uh, yeah. stuff like that. Um, so, so we, so we do get stuff like that. It, it, it varies wildly from you know project to project, but actual like mechanics design work stuff like that. Um, that's not a branch that Mindwalk has entered into, at least not yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and you also talked about the how sometimes there'll be some miscommunication or the client will change things and not tell you. Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you handle situations where like they they do that they they change something they don't tell you and then your contract only says they only bought like x amount of hours from you or do they buy just like the asset and then however much time it takes them to do it or do you like renegotiate contracts? Right. Or not? Um, well, sort of. Uh, there are two different main ways that we. Bill, uh, again, this is only speaking for MindWalk. I don't know how everybody else does it. There are asset-based uh, projects and there are resource-based projects. When we say resource, we mean artists or animators. So the client can either say, I need this many hours of, or this many man days worth of work. And usually what happens then is they send us a, um, you know, they send us their, as at their assets, we give them estimates and fill up that time that they've given us. And if something like that happens where it's like, look, you've changed this and it's going to take us five more days, we just communicate to the client and say, hey, this is going to take us five more days. Will that fit into your budget? And usually, for the most part, they'll either take something out or it'll fit into the budget anyway or whatever. Worst case scenario, then I kick it up to my boss, Mike, or Ashley, who deals with the major invoicing stuff, and they will handle it with the client, the, the contract renegotiation. That does happen sometimes. It is better to do it resource-based wise because then they say, I need five artists for this long. And then any time the client changes something, it doesn't matter because we have the artist to do it. So it's, it's easier in that sense. I think she had her hand up first. Go ahead. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that is actually um, one of the hardest things. Um, I, don't, I can't, I'll let Sean talk about the um, artist side of it, but for producers, especially since our main job is communication um, and knowing your team and, and working with them, it is really hard. Um, you, have to, you have to go out of your way to get to know guys that you can't speak their language to. Um, but we do have translators at MindWalk that are really, really awesome. And so basically anytime you're like, hey, I need to go talk to this guy, you just go grab Wendy or Rebecca or one of our awesome people and say, hey, can I talk to him? And if you have a good translator, then they'll actually translate what you're, say like what, what you're saying and the tone in which you're saying it and whatever. And personality can come through. Like, and the other thing is you would be surprised how much communication comes through, not through language. You, know, you can tell if somebody's happy or sad or whatever by the way they're standing, by the way that they're speaking, by all these things. Um, we actually did stuff like uh, MindWalk does a lot of sports tournaments and things like that. Like we had an archery tournament and I can't speak to any of those people, but we still had an awesome time shooting archery with them. You know, so you can all still point at something and laugh. Yep. You know, like I mean yeah. everyone gets that, you know, situational kind of humor, you know, things like there that. There are some things that are universal. Things that transcend language, you know, yeah. I mean hand gestures doing this, it kind of means mostly the same thing in pretty much anywhere. Yeah. Um, so to, to answer your question, it you do have to go a little bit out of your way to make sure that, that you do integrate into the team and stuff like that. But at the same time, it's easier than you might think. Yeah, um, yeah it, it's pretty much the same thing for the artist. OK. Yes? Um, after graduation, was there anything in particular that you did as a producer or an artist like improving That's actually a really good question. Uh, the, the lesson there is make friends when you're in school. Don't be a dick to people, because um, they'll remember it, seriously. Um, the, way that, the way that the story behind us getting to MindWalk was I had a friend um, who was a, a technical artist and I had another friend who was an environment artist and this technical artist friend was at GDC, it's another good lesson, go to GDC, and our boss, our current boss was walking past the SCAD booth and was like, here's a business card for a technical artist, we need one of those, we'll talk to him. 
So they did. And he got a job and he went to China. Then when they needed West, to know this chick named Amy. Well, we know this producer. And then I went there. And then he followed me. And then when Ashley was like, well, we need another Western artist, I was like, I have one. That's literally how they got all of their white people. <laughs> it's just because we sort of trained in there. So really, make friends. By the same token, I have had a few names come across my desk when they were like, oh, we need a character guy, or we need a whatever. And I was like, if you hire that person, I will leave. Straight up, because I hated working with them in school, and I will not work with them again. So don't do that to people. You know, like, because I inevitably, this industry is really, really small. Even if you go to China, this industry is really small. So don't piss people off. They will remember it, and it will hurt you. It really will. Um, I mean, it, your entire time at FIA is a job interview. Basically, yeah. Okay, like, it's, it's the job interview before the job interview, because everyone around you, at some point, even if it's 10 years from now, okay, like, they're going to remember you. I mean, this is like a small enough thing, and this is a pretty you know, pivotal enough point in your life you know, that you're going to remember the people around you, and you're going to remember, that guy really didn't pull his weight. Or that guy was, you know, he was all right, but he was kind of abrasive like, to work mm -hmm. with. So when that name comes across, even if you're not just outright like, oh, no, you know, you, you know he comes in and interviews, and you're kind of like, if, you know, you're looking for, has this person changed at all? You know, because you're already coming in with, like, a negative view with mm -hmm. someone, you know? So it's like, really, you know, work well with the people around you. Yeah. You know, it's already a skill that you should be learning anyways. Um, but, it, but it really is, I mean, like, every, everyone I know, you know, or not everyone, but most of the people I know that are from here, you know, have jobs at big companies and stuff, and it's like, when I want to move back to the States, those are some people that I'm going to hopefully be able to call and be like, hey, I saw that job was open. Would you mind pushing my portfolio through to, like, your guy? Mm -hmm. And so long as we had a good relationship in FIA, they'll be like, yeah, sure, I'd love to work with you. Let's go push it up, you know, yep. and then you got a job, you know, or at least an interview. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know, so it's, it, it works that way, period. Yep. Um, and I know that's kind of like what you hear a lot, and that's why you hear it a lot. It's because it's true. friends matter. People yep. you know matter. Yep. Um, you know, and it's not all about that. You know, it's not just, oh, well, all you have to do is know somebody. It's, you have to be good. I didn't get in because he knew people. He got in because his business card happened to be on the right table as the right dude walked past. So that's that's another thing. You know, go to GDC. You know, uh, go to go to conferences and things like that, and and meet those people. And a lot of it is just serendipity. And be involved with the community. Yeah, you know, get involved with the game community. Me, Poly Town, you know, mm -hmm. CG Society, whatever's going on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, get involved. You know, a lot of people are on Facebook now, like that. They just have artist page. I mean, my, that's what my Facebook is now. I don't. I got some friend stuff that rolls across my pages every now and again, but most of it's just cool people doing cool art and cool art meetup stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not there, so I can't go to it. <laughs> but it's that's still basically just through evolution what my Facebook has turned into. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's just like get involved. You know, talk to people. Um, be, be a part of the community, post things, you know? Uh, you may be like, oh, but my stuff's like too bad right now. Guess how you get better? You get feedback. If you just stay in this little bubble, you'll never get better. You'll mm -hmm. never get good enough. You gotta put yourself out there, test yourself against the bar. People aren't dicks, okay? I mean, like, I know it's like sometimes hard to believe that, but it's like, put yourself out there. People want to help you. There's like nothing that feels better than knowing something and then someone doesn't know it and you're like, hey, I know this thing, and it's going to make like the stuff you're doing better. Here, have this like little nugget of knowledge that I learned at some point, and they're like, "Wow, thanks, that's awesome." Yep. And you're like, "It is kind of awesome." Yeah, also, but, like that's another what happens. you know, people help. Another word to the wise, because it is the internet, you will occasionally get dicks. Ignore them; they're dicks. Nobody cares. You know, like the rest of the forum won't pay attention to them, so you shouldn't either. They're probably just mad because they don't have a job yet either. Yep. So. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, it's, it's put yourself out there, be involved. Yep. That, that's one of the biggest things. Other questions? Yep. Um, you mentioned that it was a really big problem to use Jira or ROM, and you also mentioned that Excel is a really good tool. Um, so it's sort of two questions. The first one is, how do you use Jira or ROM, and how can you avoid that? And the second one is, how can you use Jira and Excel effectively together without 
Um, the way that you use JIRA wrong is by not really knowing how to use it. Um, the examples that I have are there are some people who, uh, OK, so like a really, really super fast rundown of the way JIRA works is you've got an agile backboard and you've got a task. You can assign that task to somebody. And then the, whoever's working on it logs the time that they're using into it. And then you usually say, send to review or you know, move to you know, whatever. So it'll be like, I'm working on the model right now. And then I click on Submit for Review, and it sends it to whoever is supposed to be reviewing it. Then the reviewer looks at it and says, all right, model looks good. I'm going to hit it to Textures in Progress. Or I'm going to hit it back to Request Feedback. And then it switches back. There are some people who just don't use that function at all. And so what Jira becomes is a Facebook page for an asset. For an asset. And it's just a big old wall with like a bunch of a bunch of attachments that nobody that aren't sorted, by the way, at all. Um, and they're just sort of like all thrown in there, and you have to like dig through a bunch of estimates or dig through a bunch of attachments, dig through a bunch of comments, and trying to figure out what's going on instead of being like, I know that this asset is in this stage, it's been reviewed, and I'm ready to move on to the next thing. That's how you use it badly. And it's just by not using it correctly. Um, in terms of Excel and Jira integrating, that's not a very good example. Um, there are other there are other projects that, or there are other things that, that do actual full integration with Excel better. Um, I think, well, obviously, MS Project is a really good one because it's made by the same company. Um, but for Jira, it's really used for different things. So for MindWalk, what we do is, um, and again, I should have brought an example of what the tracker looks like. The MindWalk tracker is basically like, here's all the estimates or assets we're working on. Here's the estimate. Here's who's working on it. This is how long they've taken. This is how much time they have left. That's the really basic like rundown of it. And for Jira, what we do is then we say, well, here's how much time they spent on it today. I'm going to plug that number into Jira, and then it's there. right? Um, so the tracker lets us look at all of this all together. Jira lets, it look us, lets us look at it at a micro level, so just this asset. Um, so the, the way that those two integrate is really more they ethereal. You know, they complement each other, and it's not that they feed data. Does that make sense? OK. Others? What do you mean by rabbit holes? Uh, get some, uh, maybe you said red flag. Mm -hmm. So someone may be getting stuck on something and kind of wasting their entire time working on that same thing. Mm -hmm. um, the more common red flags, rabbit holes, things like that um, in outsourcing often come from translation issues because you're working with Chinese or Indian staff or German staff or whatever. Um, and a lot of it is just that got translated wrong, and so we did it wrong. Um, those are really hard to find because I don't speak Chinese either, so I don't know how it's been translated. But there are some things where you can look at it and, um, like, for example, if you're using a lot of metaphors, like the client was like, um, oh, a good example is the client was like, here, make this mustard colored. Okay? In China, mustard is green. Okay? Really. So, but I know that in China, mustard is green, and in the, the US and Canada, mustard is yellow. So when I took this brief to the, the translator, I was like, Say yellow, you know. Say you know, and I actually pulled up a swatch, like a color swatch, and I was like, "They mean this. Don't make it green." Um, so it's things like that, and you know, you can sort of pick up on things like that. Um, other stuff is the. Um, I'm trying to think of good examples. What are what are other ones that we've run into? Uh, it's kind of like the mustard thing. Um, there's just objects that are different. Yeah. You know? uh, there, there's just like stuff they don't have. China, you know? Oh, so one really the, good one. The roof, the roof. Yeah, we were making, <laughs> we were making a, a building, and it was like an old sort of uh, not Victorian, but like colonial style house. And the artists are like, "Where do these beams go?" And I was like, "What do you mean?" They're like, "Well, the roof beams. Like, can you ask the client to send us references of where the roof beams go?" And I was like, "No, I'm not going to ask the client to send us references of roof beams. But what I will do is I'll sit down with you and I'll tell you what I'm talking about because." Basically, they were talking about the triangular houses where the, the horizontal cross beam goes across. They were like, what on earth is that for? I've never seen that before in my life. Because in China, they don't have houses like that. So you know, that's, that's sort of the other thing. A lot of it comes from cultural differences or language differences. Cool?
all very much uh, for mm -hmm. coming all this way and stopping by, by while you're here. Um, they'll be around for a little bit if you have a few questions afterwards, you can leave them out in the hall, but we do need to relinquish the room. There is another uh, talk that is happening.